I've investigated um, whether or not that the population ratio disparity between African American women and men was true. I found that there were approximately 1.5 million to about 2 million more women to men in the population. And as I began to explore the practice of polygyny, uh, I found that it was an acceptable practice in pretty much all over the world, uh, at least 80% of the world. Uh, but it wasn't until Western world cultural domination determined it to be unacceptable in practice among un inferior people that it became to be unacceptable. Uh, so their thinking or thoughts were that uh, monogamy was a superior marriage form because of its practice among European people who they had determined were a superior people. But we all know that polygyny has been practiced also in the West under what I can call peculiar forms of polygyny where, we, where it's practiced in extramarital affairs and voyeurism, prostitution, uh, concubinage, and then, you know, contemporarily, there are various types of porn and ways in which men engage women that pretty much reduces them to their sexuality. And so it's still be, uh, commonly practiced uh, in the U.S., and it's an acceptable practice among men. Um, and although it's not acceptable among women, they participate in it. And because men could not participate in these types of uh, what I call peculiar forms of polygyny, without participation from women. And so what does, this, what does this do? It leads to dysfunctional relationship and family formations that might be beneficial for men for various reasons, but not necessarily healthy. And so what I wanted to do was I wanted to find out if there were more functional models that were more beneficial for women and for families. And so when I began to really explore and look into the practice of polygyny, I found that it was uh, practiced again throughout most of the world uh, in a study that was done on societies throughout the world, it was found that in 862 societies, 724, 84% of them had practiced polygyny. So before European world domination, it was found in North America, including Mexico and Canada, um, Central America, the Caribbean, near and Middle East, East Asia, Greenland, Australia, Indonesia, Polynesia, Phil the Philippines, and, uh, New, and, and in New Zealand. In Africa, the practice of polygamy was pretty much universal. Um, of the 297 societies, only 13 or 5% of them did not practice polygyny, and 11 of those societies were found in North Africa. Of 22 European societies that were looked at, monogamy only was practiced in 21. And so we know uh, that is, you know, it's a practice that has been practiced all over the world. Um, and so because scholars were curious about as to why polygyny was practiced, then they began to propose different ex explanations for it. One of them is the male sex drive and their propensity or predisposition, predisposition for a variety of sex partners. The other one is the long length of postpartum. Uh, and what happened in some societies, uh, early societies throughout the world, the only way to feed children was through breast milk. So for women, if women did not space children, uh, then they could endanger the life the life of the already existing child. Because of this, and then you had a, a, a long length of postpartum, which means that women had to abstain from sex for a period of time so they could be able to space their children. Economics was also explained. It was thought that uh, where women contribute substantially to production because the more wives you have, the more children you have, and that means that that's the more wealth you can build. Um, and then of course, the imbalanced sex ratio due to males being lost in warfare in occupations, uh, and then cosmology, particularly among African societies, because it was important to be remembered uh, among your um, descendants, because the, the longer you could be remembered meant that you were still alive. And so it was all tied up into their ancestry and their uh, progeny. And so if we look at the sex ratio uh, between African American um, females and males, you have substantially more men who are caught up in the prison industry or brought up in the criminal justice system than you have women. Also um, is um, the death rate among men. Uh, one of the things I would always uh, stress and talk about is that we have a silent war going on where men are the primary targets. And if this is not evident now because of the social media, then I don't know what else is, but we do lose more men annually to death. And also because of the health reasons, 
more men die earlier than, than women. Uh, and then more men date interracially, so they date outside of the race. Not to mention the that we have a disproportionate number of men who are marginalized in the opportunity structure. And of course, it's very difficult to build a relationship with men who are not financially, have some kind of ways to support themselves and their families. Early scholars, when they were looking at societies and their development, they talked about uh, humanity or societies having three stages of development. And this was savagery, barbarism, and civilization. So of course, uh, they thought that people of color were savages and, and, and existed in barbarism, and that the people who were more civilized were Europeans. So overall, their argument was that as uh, humans evolved from savagery to civilization, the family evolved from the consanguine family to the monogamy family, which they thought was a superior form. And this consanguine family just means families that were focused around the blood tie, meaning that it was focused around the bloodline versus the marriage tie. You also want to look at the role that Christian scholars played in a book called Re Polygyny Reconsidered by Eugene Hillman. He talked about how the uh, monogamy how the scriptures were used to support this whole notion or idea that monogamy was ordained by God. And so some of the scriptures that were used was the creation story, at, you know, Adam had only one wife. Deuteronomy argued that there was, an there was an argument that there was an admonition against multiplying wives, but this was taken out of context because they were talking about uh, in the excess of anything. Uh, of course, the scriptures speak to uh, uh, prohibiting adultery and divorce, but of course neither one of these uh, leads to, a polygyny leads to neither one of these. Uh, and then one of the arguments is that the, many of the biblical figures were monogamous and that the first recorded instance of uh, polyg polygyny was among the reprobate descendants of Cain. So the overall conclusion, according to Hillman, is that there is not a single passage in the Bible that stands as clear proof of God's intention on this matter. Uh, and the mothers also states that there's no case known outside of Christian nations of a people among whom it is morally reprobated. Before the Christian era, the terms monogamy, bigamy, and polygyny, polygamy in the sense that we use them were unknown. The prohibition of polygyny, which was alleged to be natural and to be met among nations of all nations in a state of refinement was actually promulgated in the first time, for the first time in the world in the cold Justinian in the sixth century, so among the Romans. Also in the mothers, he argued, the European objection to polygamy is considered incomprehensible and is interpret, interpreted as a sign of moral degeneration. Polygyny is widely regarded as a moral virtue to support as many fellow creatures as possible uh, and it's not a mark of wealth, but a form of philanthropy. So I thought that was very interesting. And so if we look at that, uh, when you look at a lot of societies, they wanted to make sure that women uh, were able to marry, had the opportunity to marry and be a part of a family. Uh, and so if you, if you have a disparity in the sex ratio, then that's gonna make it impossible for women to be able to get married and be a part of a family. So they wanted to be sure that that happened. And this is why they thought it to be ph ph philanthropic. So some people have argued uh, that the, the real crux of this has to do with reproduction competition. The, the fertility rate of peoples of color is higher than it is for whites. And so legitimate structures to support an already higher fertility rate give them an advantage in the competition for reproduction. Thus it was necessary to construct legal, moral, and social structures to prohibit polygyny while sim simultaneously construct the same to remote, promote monogamy only. And so you have other scholars who came out and argued that monogamy has existed along with heteroism, prostitution, and concubinage. And then you had also a work that was done by Gerda Lerner called The Creation of Patriarchy, where she shows that among Indo-Europeans, particularly in Mesopotamia, that the female slave uh, who were captives in war became concubines, which means that they provided domestic and sexual services. They were also sold into prostitution, um, and or, or leased into prostitution, prostitution by their captors. Uh, and also when you look at uh, uh, the creation of patriarchy in these early Indo-European societies, uh, women were separated based on their position to men. So those women who 
were uh, married or were under the protection of men and had to wear a veil versus those women who were not married and they were, did not wear a veil. Um, and so if you look at it in American, in the American experience, enslaved African women became the sexual outlets and, the, and domestic and provided domestic service in the form of the concubine who was basically the, the mammy and she also, she provided sexual and uh, domestic services. Uh, and they were also, black women also sold into sex, uh, to uh, prostitution. They were sexually assaulted. Uh, and then you had black women who served as pornographic images on the auction block, uh, where the practices of voyeurism helped white males fulfill their sexual fantasies. So it's kind of the same thing that we have in modern day, where you have uh, strip bars where men can go in and look at women and touch on them and feel on them. Um, to serve their, fulfill or serve their sexual fantasies. Then you also have Marimba Ani in the Urugu, Patricia Hill Collins and Black Feminist Thought, and they talk about um, Western systems of domination. And some of these include the spiritualization, uh, the economist thinking where you have either the either or classification, uh, opposite oppositional pairs where you have superiority versus the inferiority, paradigm, and then the object and then the objectification of women. And then we also have um, Bell Hooks, uh, where she talks about structures of dissimulation where a lot of what we do in the West uh, means it's, it's that it's acceptable to be able to put structures in place that are based on lies and based on, on truths. And so how do women separate it? Um, we have the beauty standards and of course the Afrikoi versus the Koi standards where the ideal beauty is that, that image that is closest to um, the um, closest to uh, white women. Then you have the virgin whore dichotomy. So you have the respectable versus the unrespectable and the good versus the bad. So the respectable good woman becomes the wife and the unrespectable other woman be or the unrespectable bad woman becomes the object or the other. So the other woman now becomes the spiritualized object other and they provide sexual outlets in the form of mistresses, pornography, strip bars, prostitution, and things like that. And so if we look at the models, we have the early Greco-Roman model versus the early uh, versus the af traditional African model. So the early Greco-Roman model, the wife was the legitimate uh, uh, partner who had heirs, legitimate heirs, and then you had sexual outlets in the form of concubinage and prostitution and heteroism. And then in traditional African societies, you have the, uh, the wife, uh, who had legitimate heirs who, and who served as the co-wife. You also have the second wife or third wife or however many wives. And they also, prov they all provide, all the heirs were legitimate. Um, now, because they've imposed the contemporary uh, with ways in which we do it in the West, uh, now they have what they call uh, illegitimate wives or outside wives. When you look at slavery in America, you have the wife who gave legitimate heirs and then you have the outside, or you have the um, mistress of, who were white women who had illegitimate heirs and then you have enslaved women who provided domestic and uh, sexual services and then in contemporary America we have the wife who has legitimate children and then you have um, the outside wife or, or you know children who become a part of families based on extramarital affairs but now we have all kinds of things now because we have a lot of people don't get married and so you just have the, the primary woman or the woman who might have children and just a whole number of different kinds of arrangements. But we also, in, out, with that, we also have sexual outlets where um, women also serve as, um, an, as, you know, in prostitution, provide sexual service in the form of prostitution and then video and cyber porn and, you know, peep shows and strip bars and all the various ways in which men can engage women in terms of uh, for sexual services or fulfill, to fulfill their sexual fantasies. So how do we approach relationships, marriages, and families in a way that's more healthy, particularly if we're talking about incorporating a practice like polygyny? First of all, there has to be a paradigm shift uh, and, and from old to new values. And when I say old, I'm talking about the way traditional African people practice family. If we look at the way the focus in the U.S. and is focused on individualism, which means the self or selfishness is at the center. And what Afrocentric theorists are suggesting is that we move from self at the center to we, us, and I at the center so that the we, us, and I become more 
centered than the self. And also there has to be a shift from the focus on the nuclear family, uh, which is considered the ideal model in the West. And we know that most families are, are far from nuclear, particularly African and African-American families. Uh, and we talk about the nuclear families, it really has to do with, with the way they're, tr they're doing it now, which is the enmeshed couple, where the couple is socially and emotionally dependent and, uh, and it's focused around the couple versus the extended or the expanded family. So when we look at the extended or exp expanded family, which many of us are familiar with and are from, which means you conclude your, um, it means that the, your, all your extended families are inclusive of your family. And so that means now also the self uh, becomes the community. So it's basically taking the self out of the center and putting the self in community at the center. So we also, for, particularly for men, that they have to move away from unevolved Western definitions of manhood and begin to define what it is for themselves. And when we look at Western manhood, uh, it's focused around patriarchy where males dominate and they are in control. So you have to move away from these kinds of notions about what manhood is and define it in a more healthy ways for them and themselves. And that's going to be more healthy for their families and their communities. Um, and so when we talk about redefining and redestruction, the redestructing, you also have to look at redefining and reconstructing how they see and approach women. Uh, so they have to, which means they have to rid their thought processes thought processes of, of women as being inferior beings and also as being or the whole virgin whore construct which means that they can be objects for use in order for men to be able to uh, engage in a practice like polygyny they have to be mentally emotionally financially and spiritually stable um, and they also have to be able to handle the emotional psychological intellectual sexual and spiritual needs of more than one woman and have a capacity to be fair and just. And they have to have to be able to handle the responsibility of multiple children um, and just multiple families. And so it's not something that's, um, that's a, an easy task. And we could see this right now with a lot of the blended families or, or the step families or what they call multiple uh, fertility families where nobody's married and, and women have multiple uh, um, children from multiple partners and men have multiple children from multiple partners and we know right now it creates a lot of conflict and, and uh, chaos and so there have to be some structures in place to be able to deal with that and a lot of reasons why this there is a lot of uh, conflict around these families because it's because the society that's based on this whole nuclear family model does not have support structures for these different types of families but most importantly um, when I looked at the uh, uh, society, uh, communities of African Americans who practice polygyny, they talked about that, that in order to do this in a way that's going to be productive for everybody involved, that, they, that everybody ha it has to be God-centered. Uh, for women, uh, the most significant thing that we do, that we need to do is we have to remove the veil. And even though it's not a visible veil, there is a veil that separates women based on some of these dichotomies that I talked about. And one of the ways that women, and some of the ways that women do it, and one of the ways in particular, is that I have a man and you don't. And the other thing is, this uh, the a womanist ethic of care for sisters. And so, if we look at a woman in, uh, ethic, ethic of care for sisters, we're also looking at the self as the as an ex the expanded self. And so, when we look at the way African people approach. The expanded self, the first thing is uh, that we all are divine and we all want, are worthy. And so in order for us to feel divine and to feel worthy, that we have to be right in our relationships and be, and have rightness uh, before ourselves and before our families and our communities. We also all want to be related and in community, which means that we all have the need to feel loved and to be in a relationship. And as a restorer, we are faced with the task of extinguishing any practice that diminishes our human capacity. And we want to move to the position where we restore those that allow for our families and our communities and ourselves to flourish. We want to look at that each person is unique. And in, in, that, in, 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 in that regard, that we want to understand that the need for, ev uh, for everyone to fulfill their purpose uh, and also in terms of how we look at ourselves and our bodies, we, look, we should see the body as a locus of sacredness, of beauty, 
heart, mind, and will. That means we have to see ourselves as whole and not let anybody separate parts of ourselves and objectify us. And also understanding the necessity for all to be beautiful before ourselves, our communities, and having the heart, mind, and will to rise above any emotions that prohibits us from seeing the need for all of us to be beautiful. So a woman's ethic, ethic of care means love, care, community, and truth. And ultimately, the question to ask yourself is, can you want for your sister what you want for yourself? <laughs>